Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. Today's speaker is Lizzie Poole. Lizzie is a linguist working with SIL International in Tanzania with the Mbukwe and Rangi languages. She works primarily on documentation and description of these languages, especially to support orthography development. Her MA was on Mbukwe phonology with a particular focus on consonant clusters and vowel hiatus resolution. Today, Lizzie will give her talk phonological variation in Bukwe and the implications for orthography development. Yeah, hello <laughs> again. Um, so I will be reporting on the results of a language survey that was done in April 2022 in five Bukwe villages, which aimed to investigate pronunciation differences for certain groups of words. So let me start by giving you some background information on the Bukwe language. It's a Bantu language, classified as F34, spoken in the Manyara region of Tanzania. Um, it's shaded in orange on these maps. Um, and in 2009, it was estimated that there are about 37,200 speakers. A sociolinguistic survey in 1996 made the following conclusion, that no significant dialect differences were discovered. In each village, um, it was stated that all Mbugwe speak the same Kimbugwe, location and age inclusive. None of the villagers claimed that any one location was better than another in terms of learning the purest Kimbugwe. And this was then verified in a follow-up survey in 2008, um, where the information reinforced the belief that there's not strong variation between the Mbugwe spoken in different areas, and that actually the people had a difficult time understanding questions aimed at discovering dialect differences. Um, and the final conclusion that was made by the team in that second survey was that there are no significant dialect differences in Mbugwe. There is, however, variation in the pronunciation of certain sets of words, which has prompted a lot of discussion amongst my Mbugwe college, um, colleagues regarding how those words should be spelled. So a team from SIL Tanzania traveled to the Mbugwe area to investigate these pronunciation differences and whether any correlation could be found between geography and pronunciation. The survey took place um, from the 5th till the 9th of April, 2022, and the research was conducted by the Mbugwe translators, Constantine Mafulu, Emmanuel Shishe, and Paolo Modamba, the language assessment coordinator for SIL Tanzania, um, Bernadette Mitterhofer, and me in my capacity as linguist for the Mbugwe team. During this talk, I'll outline the linguistic issues that our research was focused on and the challenges that these pose for orthography development. I'll summarize the survey findings and the implications that these have for orthography development and present the decisions made um, by a group of Mbugwe representatives regarding the spelling of these words. And finally, I'll conclude with some ideas for future research. So Mbugwe does not permit the juxtaposition of two short vowels of different qualities, and so uses several different hiatus resolution strategies when these come together at a morpheme boundary. So these include vowel elision, which is accompanied by compensatory lengthening, um, or glide formation in the syllable onset, also accompanied by compensatory lengthening, and also glide formation in the syllable coda, which is optionally accompanied by partial assimilation of the first vowel. So example one shows vowel elision with compensatory lengthening. Um, these kinds of examples are probably quite familiar to anyone who's worked on a Bantu language. Um, this process could be analysed as complete assimilation of the first vowel to the second, but since partial assimilation is also attested in Mbugwe, as we'll see later, it's simpler to analyse this as elision plus compensatory lengthening. Um, so that we don't have to try and explain why sometimes the assimilation is partial and sometimes it's complete. Um, so I'll go with this analysis. Um, for the purposes of the orthography, it doesn't really make much difference how we choose to analyse it. Um, if the first of the two adjacent um, vowels is high or mid-high, then the usual strategy is for that vowel to form a glide with compensatory lengthening of the second vowel. And again, these examples are probably quite familiar to um, people who've worked on Bantu languages um, or Swahili speakers. Um, in some cases, the consonant glide sequence that's created or that would be created within this process 
is not a permitted combination and a further strategy is needed to produce a valid word. And there are two possible strategies attested in this case, um, palatalization and elision of the consonant. So just to clarify the terminology, first of all, by palatalization, I mean the realization of the underlying consonant as a palatal consonant. For example, the velar um, stop k realized as the palatal stop ch. Um, for this reason, I'm going to avoid using the term palatalized consonant, um, which is often used um, for consonants with secondary palatal articulation, because um, I could get confusing if we try and use the same terminology for two different things. So um, those, those um, will be referred to as consonant glide sequences instead. Um, and that term will also cover consonants with secondary labial articulation. Um, and the context should make it clear whether the glide being talked about is um, palatal or labial. So let's look at some of some examples of the use of palatalization in elision in the case where glide formation would otherwise result in an unpermitted consonant glide sequence. An example of palatalization that, again, Swahili speakers will be very familiar with is the class seven prefix on a vowel initial stem. Um, so the, comp the sequence k is not permitted in Mbugwe, and so um, all of these words are realized with a palatal stop. So we have chano, chemi, cholo, and churu. Um, this process also occurs when the causative extension e is added to a k final verb stem. So we have aka be lit, but acha light. Um, and there's a few more examples on the slide. Um, so that's palatalization. Um, an example of consonant elision is when the passive extension is added to a V final verb stem, since again, the sequence vo is not permitted in a Um So we have eva steal, but ewa be stolen. Um, these two processes are obligatory, so there's no context in Mbugwe where either kya or vwa are acceptable surface forms. However, for other sequences, the equivalent processes are optional, at least in certain contexts. So if we go back to the class seven nouns that we saw in example three and look at their class eight plural forms, um, the class eight prefix is analyzed as V. Um, and here you can see two possible surface forms for each word. So for the singular chano, we can have the plural viano or yano. So in the first of each of those possibilities, um, the consonant glide sequence um, it surfaces. In the second of each, the consonant is elided and we just end up with a glide initial word. Um, so this variation only occurs with the class eight prefixes. Um, when the causative extension is added to a V final verb stem, the only acceptable pronunciation is with the consonant glide sequence. Um, so we can have quavia, but quaya is not permitted. Um, likewise, lovia, but not loya, and tovia, but not toya. In a similar way, um, palatalization is optional in the context of the diminutive plural class 19 prefix. So um, with the underlying form fi uh, for the not class 19 prefix, prefix, we can either have fiana or shana. Um, fiamberera, shamboera. Um, but again, similarly, um, in causative verbs, the only acceptable form is the sequence fia. So where we have the verb fafa to be hard, um, you can only have fafia, harden, not fascia. So to summarize those briefly, um, processes of palatalization and consonant elision are obligatory in some environments, optional in other environments, and not permitted in still other environments. So there's quite a range um, going on. 
We'll just look at one more process, um, still applying it in the context of two underlying short vowels, but this time when the second vowel is a high vowel. And several different surface forms have been attested in this context. I'll just use one noun root to illustrate the various options. So here we have the word for girls or daughters, which has an underlying a plus e sequence. Um, and one possibility is to just have elision plus compensatory lengthening, getting v retu, um, or we can have the creation of a coda, um, giving vi retu, and it's also possible for that co coda creation to be accompanied by partial assimilation of the a, um, moving further forward and further up um, to become i and have vi retu. Vi retu. Um, similarly, for the singular form, um, we can have, uh, so it has an underlying o plus e sequence, and we could have glide formation with compensatory lengthening. Glide formation has to happen in the onset. Uh, we could also have um, a glide created in the coda. And here, to avoid having a glide, two glides together, <laughs> Um, and a vowel a is inserted between the two. So there's no a in the underlying form at all, um, but it wouldn't be possible to pronounce, I'm not going to even try, um, <laughs> the, the glides consecutively. So um, an a is inserted in between. Um, and that can happen as well as the partial assimil assimilation of that a um, in the third option there. And again, that last process, we could call it an epithetic i instead of an a. Um, but since the second line of this table shows that an epithetic a is already a possibility, and we've already seen that partial assimilation is a possibility on the previous slide, it seems easier to um, combine those two together rather than add another process. Uh, another option for an epithetic vowel and say um, and say that you could also have i inserting itself. So I'm analyzing this um, as an a which gets inserted but assimilates partially to the following glide. Um, again, the exact mechanics um, are not particularly important for the orthography development. Um, so now that we've looked at the phonological processes, um, I'll outline how these cause difficulties for orthography development. So if you um, have seen the presentation that Helen and I gave about 18 months ago um, called Community Orthography Development in the Rift Valley, um, you might recall that we tried to emphasize that while SIL advises on orthography choices and decisions, um, the final decisions about how to write the language belong to the community themselves, since it's their language. Um, the best orthography is one which is actually accepted and used by the community. Um, and that doesn't necessarily match what the linguist thinks would be best. Um, Cahill 2014 writes that this acceptance depends on non-linguistic factors as much as linguistic ones. And we spoke in that presentation about how sociolinguistic, political and educational factors may well override the linguistic concerns. Um, so often these factors conflict with each other and the work of orthography development is to find the most acceptable and usable balance between all the factors, linguistic and non-linguistic. Then in an article dealing with the principles involved in de developing a new orthography. Oh, sorry. Um, Smalley 1959 gives five criteria for an adequate new writing system, one of which is to aim for maximum ease of transfer, which basically means that as far as possible, any new orthography should facilitate the transfer of literacy skills between the new orthography and another language which learners already know or want to know. So in the Tanzanian context, that means that we want Mbugwe speakers who can already read and write in Swahili to be helped to learn how to read and write in Mbugwe 
by the way that the Mbugwe orthography reflects what they know and expect from their Swahili literacy skills. And this also applies, applies in the reverse. If there are ever any Mbugwe speakers who first gain literacy, cell, literacy skills in Mbugwe, then what they have learned in Mbugwe should help rather than hinder the transfer of those skills to Swahili. So in practical terms for Mbugwe, that means that there is no question that I would advise writing the palatal stop as CH. Um, this sound in Mbugwe has variously been, been described as a palatal affricate by Dempwolf, by palatal plosive by Mouse, and in my original transcriptions, I wrote it as a post-alveolar affricate. Um, I now consider it to be a palatal plosive, um, at least phonologically, though it may well be realised with some affrication, possibly due to the influence of Swahili. That was um, a suggestion that Wilhelmsen made in her PhD thesis. Um, but the important thing in terms of the orthography is that Mbugwe speakers consider it to be the same as the sound written with CH in Swahili. Um, at the very first Mbugwe orthography workshop in September 2009, it was reported that the participants were certain that this sound should be written CH, and the linguists commented that they expected that any other option would cause problems for the transfer of literacy skills. And so I mentioned that this is what I would advise, and I would if anyone were to actually ask, However, this decision is so obvious to Mbugwe speakers that nobody has ever asked, and there's no need for me to bring it up. It's just intuitive to them. Um, so class seven nouns and causatives of K-final verbs are written with a CH, as we can see here in example 10. Similarly, since Swahili uses FY, VY, and W for the sounds F, V, and W, I'll recommend, if anyone were going to ask, but they won't with these words, because these are the only possible pronunciations, um, I'd recommend that causatives of F and V final verbs be written with F, Y and V, Y respectively, and passives of V final verbs be written with a W. Um, and so in these examples that we've just looked at, where only one pronunciation is acceptable, there isn't really any problem for the orthography decision. Um, it's easy in these cases, in the Mbugwe context, to just mirror the Swahili um, writing, and that will help people um, transfer their literacy skills if we do that. However, where there are varying pronunciations, the question of spelling is more difficult. In some cases, if the two varying sounds are not found elsewhere in the language, it's possible to use one symbol and simply teach the accompanying sound differently to different people. And that's what was done for one of the Sandawe sounds, um, as Helen Eaton described in our last talk. Um, the question facing the Sandawe team was how to represent the voiced, voiced post-alveolar affricate, J. Um, the obvious solution supported by the maximum ease of transfer principle is to use the J to match Swahili, but this isn't what was decided. And the reason for this is that whilst in the West, this phoneme is pronounced as it is in Swahili, in the East, it's realized as a voiced alveolar fricative, Z. So neither of the obvious spelling options of either J or Z work for both groups. So a compromise was made and the sound is written DZ, with people in the West being taught that this grapheme is pronounced J, and people in the East learning it as Z. So there has been a compromise on the max principle of maximum ease of transfer here, because now it doesn't match the Swahili for either group. Um, but there are other principles of orthography de design that also need to be taken into account. And again, these principles often point in different directions. So one of the other factors I'd like us to um, think about is maximum ease of learning. There are all sorts of ways in which this principle can apply, but the one I want to focus on is consistency of the sound symbol correspondences. Ideally, one sound would be represented by only one symbol, and one symbol should represent only one sound. This is where English is an excellent example of what not to do. Um, and this quote from Smalley, I think is probably my favorite quote about the English orthography, <laughs> um, but it really sums it up for English. And he says that the reason we can get along with five vowel symbols in English for our horribly complex vowel system 
is that we can force children to stay in school long enough to teach them. Um, we don't have that luxury in the Mbugwe context, or indeed in the context of most of the minority languages of the world. It would be unfair on our learners to expect that since readers can learn to cope with the inconsistencies of the English orthography so successfully, that new and Bulgari readers will similarly be able to cope with an inconsistent system. The contexts in which people are learning to read these two languages are completely different. Um, instead, we will seek to minimise the inconsistencies to make it as easy as possible for people to learn to read, because if it seems too hard, all except the most motivated will just be too discouraged to continue. So this means that the tactic Sandawe used for the dialectal differences isn't ideal from Bugwe. Crucially in Sandawe, the two sounds are different everywhere in the language. The Western group only has J and the Eastern group only has Z. That's not the case from Bugwe. All of the sounds we've looked at in Mbugwe are used by all speakers and they will expect the following sound symbol correspondences from their knowledge of Swahili. So um, VY will intuitively represent V. Y will be Y, FY will be F, and SH will be SH. Um, that's just going to make sense to um, Mbugwe speakers. The problem is that all four sounds are used by, by all speakers in some environments, but in other environments, there's variation. So we'll write in, we'll write VY, Y, FY, and SH in the context where these are the only acceptable pronunciations. But the question is how to spell the words with different, different possible pronunciations, such as the class eight and 19 nouns. Um, so in this case, if we were to introduce a new symbol for each of these sounds, possibly like um, these ones I've chosen in example 13, we would have a system where people would have to learn that one sound is represented by two different symbols. One being the symbol that they expect from Swahili, um, and the other one in these contexts being something totally new. Um, and this is unlikely to be met with approval by the Mbugwe community. Um, actually, as I was deciding which symbol to use as the example for the class eight nouns, um, I decided that I actually quite like the idea of the IPA voiced velar fricative symbol. Um, it kind of looks like a mixture between a V and a Y, which given the sounds it's supposed to represent is quite satisfying. However, the fact that I quite like it does not mean it's a good idea from Bugwe speakers. And so that's not what I would recommend. Um, instead, we carried out the language survey to try and find out whether for class eight nouns, either VY or Y would work for the whole community. Um, and for class 19, whether FY or SH would work. Um, we know that these are different pronunciations, but we were interested in finding out if one of them was perhaps more prestigious than the other. Um, if there was yeah, if there was any geographical pattern to their use and to try and find out whether one of each of the choices um, would be acceptable to everybody, even if it wasn't their personal pronunciation. Um, and the problem for that, um, the a plus e and of plus e sequences is similar. We're trying to define a consistent spelling rule where acceptable pronunciation varies. So in this case, um, we saw that there were three possible pronunciations for each of these words. But in addition, if we choose to represent the pronunciation that uses um, coda formation, we also have the question of whether to write that coda sound as an E, um, the vowel E or as a Y. So there's actually five possible choices for each of these words. Um, so again, the aim of the survey was to find out whether one of these would be acceptable to everybody, again, even if it didn't necessarily match their own pronunciation. So we visited five 
different Mbugwe villages marked on this map here. And we always expected that we wouldn't get participants of school age since they would be in school while we were there. So we also arranged to go to Mbugwe Secondary School, and that's the sixth pin on the map. Um, I'll talk about what we, there, what we did there a little bit later, but for the moment we'll focus on what we found in the different villages. And actually only one of the issues um, under investigation was particularly conclusive, um, and that was to do with the Class 19 nouns. So while everybody agreed that both pronunciations um, resulted in valid Mbugwe words, there was definitely a general preference for sh over fye. Um, and actually one person in one village also commented that sh would mean, would be small, it would be the diminutive, but fye would be very small. Um, and I'll return to that observation later. Um, but the main finding was that there's no correlation between geography and pronunciation. All the pronunciations were tested everywhere. And although there were a few individuals who expressed very strong preferences, they were not particularly representative of the whole group in their location. Um, more often, there was general acceptance of different pronunciations and repeated emphasis, the, the participants were very keen that we understood there is only one Mbugwe and that everybody understands everybody without any difficulty. Um, so this was expected given the conclusions of the earlier surveys, um, but there was always a chance that some information had been missed. Um, the, the previous surveys both used primarily qualitative data to investigate dialect differences and used interview questions such as where is the best Kimbugwe spoken? Can you tell where someone is from is where someone is from by the way they speak? Um, and whether words have different meanings in different places. Uh, a word list was recorded in the 2008 survey, but only in one of the villages and only one of the words had an environment which could have alerted researchers to the variation. So we thought it was worth reinvestigating this um, with words that we knew did have different pronunciations. Um, but as I've said, that it didn't seem to um, it didn't seem to be any correlation. Another possibility is that the differences are due to language changing over time. And to investigate this, we'd want to consider whether there's correlation between a speaker's age and their pronunciation. So this table gives some information about the participants. Um, and one thing that's noteworthy is the high average age. Um, this is, of course, partly due to the fact that there are no school age people included. Um, but it does also, if we look at this chart, it does also suggest a lack of representation of people in their 20s and 30s. Um, ideally, of course, we would want our sample to um, have a spread of ages in proportion to the whole Mbugwe population. Um, and I don't have data for Mbugwe, but the population for Tanzania is publicly available. And this second chart shows the projected population um, of Tanzania by age group um, in 2021, based on census data from 2012. Um, it is, of course, an assumption that the spread of the Mbugwe population mirrors that of Tanzania as a whole. But I think it's still fair to say that in the survey sample, the under 40s age group is underrepresented. Um, so it's not really fair to try and look at the data we collected and make any conclusions, um, certainly any definitive conclusions about um, age and pronunciation. One comparison we can make is between the data collected in the village locations and that collected at the secondary school. We were very grateful to the headmaster to allow us to talk with a group of form four and six students, but we could only use an hour or so of their time, whereas the data collection in each village took about four hours. So we only collected a subset of the data from the school pupils. But even with this limited data, I believe the results indicate that age may be a factor which influences a speaker's pronunciation. Although this definitely requires more research before we can draw any conclusions. I'll talk you through what took place when we were visiting the school to show why I think this is worth further investigation. 
So I had asked if we could speak to a group of 10 or 15 pupils, but um, we were taken to a room with 40 pupils waiting for us. So we had to change um, the methodology slightly. And instead of just asking everybody to give their ideas, because there were far too many people for that to work, um, I asked a question. Pupils raised their hand if they had an answer. And one of my Mbugwe colleagues chose a student to answer the question. I then followed up by asking if everyone agreed or whether anyone had a different answer that they wanted to share. So the first question I asked um, in relation to the O plus E and A plus E sequences was how to say grandchild in a bugwe, which has the under for underlying form seen in the first line here, mo, and then the root is ijokolo. So pretty much all the students put up their hands. Um, for us, for maybe I should add, we did check before we did this that each that the students who who were there all did speak Mbugwe at home as their first language. So um yeah, <laughs> these were um first language Mbugwe speakers. Um and so the true the student who was chosen to answer um gave the answer Mui Jokolo. And when I asked if other people agreed, everybody said yes, except one student who suggested Mwai Jokolo as an alternative. So then we asked the students to vote between the two, which one they thought um, was the right Mbugwe word or which one was their preferred word. And all of them, including the the student who had first suggested Mui Jokolo voted for Mui Jokolo. Um, this was a little perplexing at first. I was quite surprised and asked, I think we repeated the vote to make sure we'd got them the right way around. Um, but that's definitely what happened. And exactly the same thing happened with the plural form, except the one, um, so we, the first answer we got was V Jokolo, and then one student, but a different one, to for the singular word, um, but that one student suggested vijokolo. And then when we voted, everybody voted for vijokolo, although they had all seconds previously agreed that vijokolo was sounded right. So what are we to make of this? Um, vowel elision and compensatory lengthening was clearly what they said naturally and initially agreed was correct, but when prompted to vote, all voted for coda formation. And when they voted, all of the hands went up immediately. There was nothing to suggest that anyone was waiting to see what other people voted for before they did. Um, the speed at which it happened, there was not time for that to have been going on. Um, and that makes me wonder if we are dealing with a case of language change here. So younger people themselves may be saying we jokolo and we jokolo, but they seem to consider Mwai Jokolo and Vai Jokolo to be proper Mbugwe if they're asked about it. Um, and if, if this is the case, and if language change is the reason for this difference, then I think we're at a very early stage. The teenagers are speaking differently, but the change isn't particularly ingrained and all actually consider um, a different form to be more prestigious or more correct. This idea of language change might also be at work in the distinction between via and ye. And at first I rejected this because I would expect change over time to be loss of a segment rather than addition. Um, and the school pupils all consistently said via. However, the discussion I observed the following day in the village of Ngole has made me rethink my initial analysis and therefore the expected direction of the change. So, there, I found it really difficult to decide whether people were saying via or ye. And my Mbugwe colleague as well, who was writing down what people were saying, um, he also asked for clarification. So we would get an answer. Mze Mufulu would repeat what had been said with a very clear fricative v, really emphasizing it. Um, and that was strongly rejected by the group who replied again without any fricative 
being um, discernible, um, just a glide. So this happened several times. Um, we could hear something before the year, but the fricative was rejected. And on the second repeat, there wasn't anything discernible before the glide. And as I watched these interactions, it occurred to me that perhaps the initial response actually had a labiodental flap, b, rather than a fricative. That would account for us hearing something, and particularly for my Mbugwe colleague not knowing how to write it down. He knew it was different to both via and ya, but he didn't have a way of describing or writing it. I, of course, don't have that excuse, um, except for the fact that I was also thinking from the perspective of spelling options rather than pure phonetic transcription. Um, so it took me a while to cotton on that this might be what was happening. Um, so now I wonder whether the class H prefix would be more accurately analysed as having a labiodental flap rather than the fricative. And if that is the case, then it makes more sense for a, uh, a language, for the language change to be heading in the direction of strengthening the flap into a fricative because of the influence of that sound in Swahili. Um, and that could also be why the group so strongly rejected it out of um, one, considering that that the the v with the very clear fricative sounded too much like Swahili, um, and wanting to be clear that the Mbugwe was different, um, and so overcompensating by dropping the flap completely when they repeated it. Um, so at the school, as I said, pupils consistently used via with the fricative. Um, and so if this is language change, I think this process is further advanced than, um, than the I versus E question. Um, so there was no question in the school um, that just a year was a was a possible pronunciation. That didn't um, that didn't come up at all. So what are the implications of this for orthography development? One thing that is clear is that there probably isn't, oops, sorry, I forgot to move on to that slide, but I've said it all, so <laughs> next one. Um, one thing that is clear is that there's probably no really bad decision. Um, the general acceptance that the community has for varying pronunciations is an encouraging sign of their unity. And that means there's a greater chance of any decision being accepted as a form of correct and bugwe, even if it doesn't match someone's own pronunciation. So I didn't really want to make any definitive recommendations. And instead, um, I talked with my Mbugwe colleagues about what they thought would make the most sense and what they thought we should say to the language committee who would be making the final decision. Um, however, in addition to summarising the results with them, I did point out various things that they might want to think about um, as they looked at what their preferred options would be. First of all, um, it was fact that there was a general preference for sh over fear. Um, and when considering vy versus y, um, from a reading perspective, it's easier for a reader to skip a sound that is written rather than add a sound that isn't written. Um, you don't know which sound to add if it's not there, but you can just skip something that you don't want to say if it is there. Um, and I also highlighted that while it may be that the language is changing from a preference for I to E, um, that younger people do still seem to consider I to be a correct form, even if it's not their natural pronunciation. So we held a language committee meeting on the 20th of March this year and presented the, community, the committee members with a summary of the results. We explained that we'd come up with some options of how to spell these words and that we would like them on behalf of the community to recommend which of the options we should use in our work. We emphasised that by choosing a spelling, we weren't saying that one pronunciation was better than another. We weren't saying that people should um, start only using one particular pronunciation, but that it would just be confusing for readers if the same word was spelt differently in different places 
And so for some words, we just needed to choose a spelling. Um, and it would be important that that spelling was an option that everybody could accept, even if it wouldn't be their first choice. Um, so for the class eight nouns, VY versus Y, we gave them the following list. So um, the Swahili is written in the first column, and then we have the class seven noun, um, singular, in the second column, and then um, two versions of the class eight plural form. And the decision was unanimous and without the need for any, for much discussion at all, um, that the spelling should be with VY. Um, I mean, people wanted to, to discuss it, but what they all wanted to say was the same thing. So <laughs> there wasn't any um, kind of to and fro discussion. It was just everybody wanting to agree with the, what the previous person had said. Um, so the examples we gave for FY and SH were set out in a similar way. Um, and again, the decision was unanimous to use SH. There was a bit more discussion about these words. Um, and at least some of the people present understood the two forms to have slightly different meanings. So I mentioned this briefly earlier about the man in Maholoi who said that sh would be small, but fia would be very small. This group of people, the language committee, um, interpreted the two form said, sorry, those in the in this group who who interpreted the two forms with different meanings said that the pronunciation using eh, using fia was derogatory. Um, that's something I would like to look into further because it was the first time I had heard it. Um, but in terms of with of the orthography, it definitely indicates that spelling these words with sh is more appropriate so that we don't accidentally introduce a derogatory meaning where it's not intended. Um, even if that's not un understood that way by everybody, we don't want to risk some people understanding it that way. Um, it also means that we could have the option to deliberately use FY if we did want to um, imply a derogatory meaning. But I think, again, um, we'd need to verify that that interpretation is widespread enough um, before, um, before we do that. So the question of the a and plus e and o plus e sequences was a bit more complicated because of there being so many different options. Um, my Mbugwe colleagues didn't think it would be a good idea to present the language committee with all of the possibilities, as it might seem overwhelming. Um, so we chose two sets of spellings, one that represented the vowel elision process and the other one that represented coda formation. They intuitively feel, as in my Mbugwe colleagues, intuitively feel that the coda should be written with a Y, not an I, because it's definitely only one syllable. And so that was the option we chose to present. Um, and we didn't give the option of partial assimilation. So this is what they received. Um, and we did, in this case, mention the possibility that the first column may better represent how older people speak and the second column younger people. But we did also say that we couldn't be certain of that, but it was a possibility. And again, the decision was unanimous to write um, as it is in the first column, the AY. So one of the concerns with some of these decisions, um, particularly this one, is that all of the language committee members who were present were over 40. Um, so we do need to do some testing to find out whether younger people would find these decisions acceptable. Um, and it's also worth commenting that all of the decisions need to be tested over a period of time to see if they actually work well in practice. Only as people start trying to use the orthography that we're developing, will we be able to tell whether it really is fit for purpose? And so um, while we'll go ahead with these spellings for the moment, um, we'll hold on to the decisions lightly for the time being, and we're definitely open to changing them if um, if that seems the right the right thing to do at a later point. Um, so I've already mentioned most of these areas for future research, but I'll con conclude by collecting them together. So the first question is: Are the differences that have been described here due to language change? Um, is there any correlation between the speaker's age and their pronunciation? 
Um, and then secondly, as I've already mentioned as well, is the underlying form of the class H prefix actually a labiodental flap rather than the labiodental fricative? Um, I need to go back and listen to <laughs> some of my recordings um, with that as a possibility. Um, thirdly, does the interpretation that a class 19 noun pronounced with fear is derogatory, um, does that interpretation hold widely? And if so, what's the implication for consonant initial class 19 nouns where the only possible pronunciation is fee? Um, for example, the word fee tavana, boys, because the root tavana is consonant initial, there's never the environment present for um, the glide formation or which would then lead to the palatalization. Um, so if this is if this is a widespread interpretation, what would a derogatory form of the word fitavana look like? Um, and one final question relates to the history of the Imbugwe. Um, I've heard several times anecdotally that at some point in living memory, the government moved the Imbugwe people around and all the villages got mixed up. Um, and I can't see who all the participants are at the moment, but if Martin's here, then that might be something he knows a bit more about than I do. Um, I've not had a chance to look into it properly. But if if that is the case, um, is it possible that at one time there was a correlation between geography and pronunciation, which has now been obscured by the villagers being mixed up and the current generations have heard um, both pronunciations um, most of their lives and so we're just accepting of both pronunciations. Um, yeah, um, yeah, we'll see. Um, so that concludes today's talk, except to say thank you for your attention and invite any um, comments or questions that you may have. I see that Helen was first, um, so I'll ask her to- Thank you, Lizzie. Um, I was just curious whether at any point you had a sense that there were <clears throat> certain words which were more likely to be pronounced in certain ways, um, where there were two or more <laughs> variants, um, and whether that might there might be something going on there, because um, I've, in uh, looking at Pangua here in Mbeya, I've wondered sometimes if the, the words that are more common um, have a slightly different variant that they're more likely to be pronounced with compared to less common. Or another option might be the tone. If the tone affects something to do with the what's going on with the hiatus and the syllables. So just wondering if you'd thought about that or you'd got any sense of that. Yeah, so um, there was definitely class 19 diminutive plurals is is unusual. There's not a lot of cases where you're going where people use those words in everyday life. So certainly for some of the words, particularly words that came from more unusual um, noun class pairings, it was very difficult for people to come up with a possibility. And so um, I think particularly for things in 15, 6, um, legs and ears, that was really hard. Um, so I think legs, we had um, fiolo, sholo, fiaolo, shaolo, yeah, all sorts. Um, and for ears, we again, we had fito, um, fimato, um, shamato. We had all sorts of things um, because they're not very usual. So yes, particularly for the more unusual noun class pairings, um, it was difficult. Also, something which I didn't go into here because it would have taken far too long <laughs> was that um, as a result of this, I've also started to posit a class 12A, 19A, because there are definitely nouns which could only have sha, um, including on consonant initial stems. So that's not, that can't be down to a phonological process, um, or if it is, it's a really old one that we've completely lost um, synchronically. So in those cases, um, 
it, it often occurs if the diminutive prefix is added on to the original noun class prefix rather than replacing it. So um, <clears throat> that happens in class three, four and in seven, eight. Um, so for those words, I posited 12A, 19A. Um, but they, so those ones, it was clear what they were. There was no question, really. Um, when I asked if yeah was a possibility, people were like, oh, well, I, maybe, but it was clear that they didn't really think anyone would say that. They just didn't want to say, no, that sounds stupid. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, thanks. It's interesting. There is, yeah, there's a lot more variety and detail even beyond what you've shown us, which is really There's quite a lot going on, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, then the next person to raise his hand was Martin. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Lizzie. A, a very a, interesting also these extra remarks that you that you make now. And um, um, I have a few questions and remarks about uh, the epithetic uh, vowel that was in the I think you started with the girls, the the vaireto or yeah, the uh, vaireto, and then uh, and then there it's not epithetic, but then in the singular counterpart you will have to call it epithetic. Yeah. But, uh, another motivation is is probably also uh, just the the relationship between the singular and the plural. So. Yeah, and I did consider that whether there was a kind of reanalysis of the stem being yeah. I retu. Um, however, that process, the, the same variation um, happens where there isn't any um, any pair with an a as a prefix. So mm. it happens for class. Uh, I think you just mentioned it for nineteen. If I right it. yes yeah. um yeah. it also it also happens on verbs um so verbal prefixes and i think um for those ones it's it's clear that the stem is for example e color um because it, it appears in that form in multiple places and yet when you have um something like and they lived it comes out vakaika, um, sorry, um, it would be, and we lived. It mm -hmm. comes out as kwaikala, not koikala. Um, so, yeah, I think um, I did, mm -hmm. I did mm -hmm. think about it and I haven't completely ruled it out. It, it does, it, it would, it, yeah, it's very possible for nouns, whether it's, I don't know how far that kind of thing that kind of sound change could be adopted um, if seeing it in one context is enough to kind of make it happen everywhere. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, the other one is the labiodental uh, flap. Mm -hmm. I would have to look back at, but I think the older sources for Rangi, they have labiodental flaps for in, in other situations. Uh, okay. That's interesting. Well, I maybe, haven't maybe noticed there is that. Something going on, yeah, historically. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'll. Um, I've got Dempvol's description of Rangi, so maybe I'll have a look in there. Um, uh, no, it's older. Um, oh, okay. It's the nineteenth century. Thank you. I, I, it's interesting these things about um, the derogatory and and mm. all of that. Um, well, the, the the derivation into nineteen for diminutive will always also have this option of derogatory in most Bantu languages. So, okay. So I think what is going on is that you you put them on the spot in a way to say what is the difference. Right. And, maybe. Yeah. And then they put one meaning on one of the sides, and that that's my my. My guess yeah. that that is what is happening. Yeah, I don't recall asking explicitly what the difference was. Oh, okay. It did seem it was information volunteered by mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. not in but, response but to any question. But they had the two forms. They had the two so, forms in, in opposition. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Yeah. But yeah, I definitely want to look into that one further. Yeah. Yeah. And you want me to say something about uh... <laughs> I just wondered if you had any any thoughts on it. Uh well, I mean that that, that reshuffling um that was in the, that was in the villagization times in Tanzania. Mm -hmm. Um did you ask for clans? So I, I don't expect there to be a relationship between okay. communication and clan, but but that if 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 you want to relate it to anything original, then then that will be the way to uh, to to okay. look for that. I, I I wonder because I that that could be the case. I mean theoretically. Uh, yeah. when you link it to to the incoming uh, people with a different language and but i don't see as and any of these variations to have but i don't see it automatically linked to to another uh, second language background in the past or mm. anything like that so okay. i don't expect it to be but but you do um, i don't think you will you asked clans did you no, no no didn't um it might be that one of the translators in particular seems to know everybody so he might be able to look back at the, the list clans. of names and and tell me, tell me uh, then. so i could i could try and follow up on that um if you ever know tell me <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, thank you i'll i'll shut up and come back if there's time <laughs> I'll go briefly to the chat where there have been some questions from Andrew Harvey. So I'll read them out loud for the recording, but you can read along if you want. Um, so he says, thanks for the talk, Lizzie. I really appreciate this fine grained account of photography development as well as language change in progress and the ways in which we might see it and how people experience it in some very subtle ways. He's got two questions. And the first one is, what is the current status of the Mbukwe orthography with the SIL classification of orthographies? And his second question is, besides scripture, what are Mbukwe speakers talking about using the orthography for? Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Um, so the first one, there's not actually an SIL global <laughs> um, classification of orthographies, but in Tanzania, we use a system that starts off with experimental, um, which means we're really at the very early stages of doing any research and just figuring out an alphabet. Um, Mbugwe is currently at the next stage, which is called trial orthography. So um, at that point, we've got an alphabet that we think has all of the graphemes that are needed. Um, and we've started to make decisions on some things like word breaks and um, tone marking. Um, but um, we are fairly confident there are going to need to be changes <laughs> um, before we do too much widespread publishing. Um, yeah, the next one would be approved where the orthography has um, been tested. Um, enough people have received some literacy training for us to be able to test the orthography and the community have agreed that um, the system looks um, like one they want to use um and then a while later um hope i, I guess to say uh, approved would hope that there's not going to be any major changes um and then established is essentially when approved has gone on for a while without any changes um yeah so Mbugwe is at trial so um fairly early on we've still got these kinds of decisions um, were needing to be made before we could move on. Um, and we need to do some literacy teaching to actually get it being used before we can test it effectively. Um, so then the second question, besides scripture, what are they talking about using the orthography for? Um, we're holding a writer's workshop in July, um, where we're hoping to get people to start writing. Um, we'll probably start with um, traditional narratives, that would probably be the easiest thing for people to start out with. Um, so obviously SIL um, is um, primarily looking at um, 
theosophical development with a view to Bible translation, but we are also, um, it is also language development. Um, I don't, I think, it was before my time, I guess, <laughs> that the Mbugwe project started. Um, but those kinds of questions about, do they think literacy is worth it in Mbugwe? Those were asked, um, I guess, in the early 2000s. Um, and kind of scraping my memory of what I've read, um, um, there were suggestions that, that yeah, they wanted a um, record of um, traditional folk tales, um, definitely of proverbs, um there is a man who's written a history of the Mbugwe and he would really like that to be um he would like that to be um printed at some point um every year we print a calendar for um for the group and they really like those um so yeah there's a few a variety of things that we're hoping but really <laughs> that's kind of on them <laughs> to do what they want with it so we can we can help get them to a stage at where there is an orthography to use um and then it's up to them how they go on with it um yeah and i see there's another raised hand from peter so i'll ask him to unmute yeah. thank you so much uh, lizzie for such a wonderful presentation I, I, i'm i'm really thrilled by you uh, exposition now my question was uh, about uh, the fact that uh, uh, many of the speakers of um, bukwe language must be bilinguals mm -hmm. uh, so how did you check for or control um, or account for uh, borrowed words from you know the other language like swahili especially yeah so um obviously some swahili words are also similar to mbugwe words just because they're bantu words so i didn't try and just rule out um anything that looks like it might be similar to swahili but i was careful to make sure we didn't have words that clearly had come into swahili via arabic or english or any of those other languages um that wasn't too hard to do since they often end up in class nine and 10 and none of the processes that I was looking at affect um, nouns in classes nine and 10. So um, I don't think I really had to rule much out in terms of borrowed words. Thank you. Yeah, um, something that you didn't talk about, but I'm curious, the, the vowel length uh, is, um, so you, you show the, uh, the, that they're writing long vowels, or I, I think that that that's what I saw on the slides. Yeah. Is that um, that? Uh, yeah. Can you tell me about the reactions to to writing vowel length? Um. So we haven't done we, we haven't done a lot of literacy teaching yet. Almost mm -hmm. none, in fact, because um, we don't want to do too much and then discover we're going to have to change it. Um, so. There's, um, yeah, so not a lot has gone on. I think um, from what we have done, usually people are a little perplexed at the idea to start with, um, but there are a lot of examples of minimal pairs in Mbugwe that um, once we've talked about those, that usually convinces people that it's a good idea to write vowel length. Um, takes a little bit longer for people to get used to doing it, of course. Um, so yeah um and then we still those, need to figure still yeah, need to it but those cases of com compensatory lengthening do they also mm -hmm. write that so they do so that decision was made before i started and mm -hmm. i knew having talked about exactly this issue with my colleagues in umbeya I did wonder <laughs> why that decision had been made. And it appears that the decision was originally made in essentially because it was made in Rangi um, in order that if there was, if the decision was going to be to write lexical tone, there was a way to write 
rising and falling tones without introducing circumflexes. So we'd only need an acute accent and a grave accent. Um, so that's maybe not the best reasoning, but there we go. Um, and it has actually turned out that in both Rangi and Mbugwe, certainly compensatory lengthening before a prenasalized consonant is not, doesn't always happen. There are minimal pairs. Um, so actually it turns out that that decision, even if made for the wrong reason, probably has, it's, it's had the right, um, it's turned out right. Um, so I think certainly in, Rang in Rangi, there are minimal pairs. In Mbugwe, there, I'd have to double check if they're minimal or just similar. Um, but I think, yeah, there's, I think the word for, for walking, or there's definitely a few, if, there, if there's a consonant vowel, pre-nasalized consonant verb stem, often if you add a stative, a stative or neuter, whichever one you want to call it, um, extension, then the vowel in the before the pre-nasalized consonant is not lengthened, or mm. it's lengthened and then shortened, or however you mm. want to think about it happening. So there are there are processes that make it make sense to write the distinction even in in compensatory lengthening environments. Um, yeah, which we only I only discovered that from Bugwe pretty recently. So it was nice to have that thinking because it was always something I thought, oh, I'm not sure if we're going to want to change this, but um, it looks like it's going to work. Um, Very similar to the problems in Iraq. OK, yeah. yeah. So I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations uh, can be found in the um, YouTube page of the Rift Valley Network, um, as well as uh, added to the Rift Valley Bibliography. Looking ahead, the next webinar will be on Wednesday, the 17th of May, presented by Ahmed Sosal, and it's titled Lateral Obstruents in the Taita Hills, an Aerial Historical Perspective. Um, so, Lizzie, thank you again for your presentation and everyone else for participating today. And I look forward to seeing you at the next webinar.